Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have Kirsty Worth with me today. Kirsty, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I am so stoked to be here. Oh, we had such a ball last time on your <laughs> your podcast that uh, you know we we we're doing the reverse interview today because you are a wealth of knowledge. Kirsty, can you give us a bit of background about what you do, and then? Um, who you are, where you come from, and all that, but and and why you got into this into this cultured wellness as your as your brand. So yeah. tell us a little bit. Yeah, look, um, look, I'm like everyone else that starts a company. It seems there's a big mission and a big passion behind it, and from it's come from my own experience, and specifically from my experience of what my son went through. So. You know, like it's funny, I joke about it all the time. My parents had a business when I was a teenager and I reckon, you know, I could have a million dollars for the amount of times I would have said, I am never going to have a business. Never <laughs> would I do that? Never, never, never. And Too hard. Right. <laughs> yeah. Here I am, you know, five years later and cultured wellness is just such a, a wonderful community and a wonderful hub for people. And The reason why I went from never to, you know, jumping right on in is because, you know, what I have seen of how important your gut is and how it can completely change the pathway of your life. It can completely change who you are as a person, the pathway of your life. Yeah, I just found it a bit hard to sit on the sidelines and and watch that. So slowly but surely, yeah, I just started helping people and then my company started. So it's been a really interesting thing because it wasn't as if I sat out, you know, set out one day, I'm going to start a business because I, you know, don't want to work for anyone else anymore. But the, the reason why it started was because, you know, I suppose um, like my parents can track back for me personally, um, a big change in my health and in my personality, my resilience, my um, you know, sort of emotional capabilities at around two, which is a bit sad. Oh, wow. Very early. <laughs> Way really? too early. Yes. Yeah. So from about the age of two onwards, I had random health conditions. I had constant sore throats. Oh, wow. And I always had a tummy upset. So found it hard to sleep, had tummy upset. So I'd have a swinging between constipation, diarrhea. But because my mum has you know, a tummy upset and my Nana had it. And my great grandfather um, passed away from bowel cancer. Oh wow! It was really normalized that, you know, you'd eat something and go, Oh, that went straight through me or better rush to the toilet. And so it was this kind of normal dialogue and there was no kind of, well, this is not normal. This is not normal. And no curious thinking as to, well, if I have eaten those nutrients, if it's going straight out the other end, how am I actually surviving here? Where's my nutrients? How am I actually going to thrive? So I had a kind of a big landmark, you know, sort of poignant time in my life when I was around 13 and I was hospitalized for about a week and I had um, viral encephalitis. So my brain exploded, wow. you know, oh. and I, yeah, and it was horrible. I went through having a lumbar puncture and not really knowing what was going on and just this constant questioning of, well, this blood test is right, but this isn't right. And we don't know what's wrong with you. We'll just send you home. And so from then on, I had a lot of um, brain issues, a lot of viral issues and just kind of rode the storm. You know, I would have really flat days. I just feel terrible. I could barely get out of bed. But, you know, thankfully I I have my outdoor sports. And so, you know, nature absolutely saved me and, you know, I was able to find peace and strength out in nature. But for eons of time and for all of my travelling, I lived overseas, I did really cool stuff, I taught outdoor education, lots and lots of um, university degrees and research and so forth, and I just put up with it. So It just became normal for you constant gut issues never questioned it and it was only until I met my husband who is a nurse and he was like you know like it's actually not normal to have that much diarrhea like if you were my patient I would have you in the gastro ward and we would be finding out what's going on yeah and so then I went on a bit of an investigation about you know maybe it's gluten maybe I should go gluten free. Mm. then I had a look at maybe I should go dairy free keep the sugars low 
and I noticed an improvement in my sport. And so wow. I thought, well, if my sport's improved, then I'm going to do this because I love my sport. <laughs> um, but, you know, I just didn't, you know, I'd eat the gluten here and there. I'd, you know, go out and party or, you know, I was young. Like I was just, I'd give it a go, but I didn't dive on in. I didn't commit and I didn't really go to find the answers. But, it, you know, as all of us know that are mums, it is not until your child has an issue. Do you just go in like an absolute lioness yeah. and you get to the bottom of something? So when my son Noah was born, he um, it was a traumatic birth. There was a lot of stuff that happened during the birth. We were separated. I had oh. a lot of bleeding and a lot of issues. And so, he, you know, he started the world in that nervous system of fight or flight. Wow. And then he was tracking along beautifully. He had some gut issues, had some colic, but things were going well. But around at 13 months, we went to Fiji and we went to a surf camp. And unfortunately, he contracted a Giardia, which oh, you've probably yep. heard that from your yep. travels. And it's horrific. Yeah. Absolutely horrific. Mm. And then when he came back, he had ear infections. So on the antibiotics, he went. And then he had tummy troubles. So the mm. doctor said, well, let's just give him Nurofen or let's put him on Losec, which is um, oh, yeah. a stomach acid suppressant. And then he started having, he got Giardia again. Then he got more ear infections. And so we were just swinging between which medication to give him now. And he was progressing beautifully. And I'll never, ever forget I was down at like this, you know, seaside place that our family goes to. And he was probably only about 13 months and, and he was kicking the soccer ball. And this beautiful dear old lady, she would have been about 70, said, oh, he'll be playing for Australia one day. And I, was, <laughs> and I just like, absolutely he will. <laughs> He's my boy. And, you know, my brother played professional football. And, wow. and, and I was like, this is, this is the dreams. You know, look at him. He's so strong and robust and he's just amazing. And then, you know, it would have been only probably six months to eight months later, he was just a completely different kid. He'd gone from the dreams of, you know, him just absolutely shining and I'm going to have to give up my career to drive into all these different sports and, you know, like <laughs> be, the, be the mom. And I was teaching PE at the time and just such a beautiful time. Yep. Then just get to this point at yeah, around so 18 months where he was completely nonverbal. So he'd lost all oh, of his. Wow. Life. He would just sit and all lie on the floor and just stare at the ceiling he would just track cars back and forth back and forth and oh. um just screamed the whole time he would only eat white food constant horrific diarrhea like I would have to leave mm. him in the bath with just you know just oh. yellow diarrhea coming out and we were you know we took him to the pediatricians and well it's toddler diarrhea or you're a new mum, you know, kids cry. He's probably a little bit unsettled, but you're okay. You're a new mum. And, then, you know, I was like, yeah, but I've got, you know, a husband who's medically trained here. Yeah, but he's covered this is not normal. But what is going on here? And, and we were, you know, just normalise it. It'll be fine. And so it continued. And then his behaviour just continued to get worse. It was really heartbreaking and also almost completely unmanageable wow he would scream all night he'd scream all day he um, was always in pain or he was asleep he had no energy he could not socialize oh, horrific yeah and just completely non non-verbal like there was no communication with him so it got to a point that um he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum mm, i was just gonna say yeah. yeah and i wasn't a fan of going through that process but I was a fan of receiving some funding to find out how am I going to get and afford a speech path to help, an OT to support this. How am I going to, where's the psychologist to help with this social <laughs> situation? So I, we, we went down that path yeah. for the funding so much, you know, and, but there was always this, you know, in the back of my mind, like I have diarrhea just constantly. He's got it. When I get diarrhea, I feel terrible I don't want to talk to anyone I just want to lie and like hide in the room yep, yep. I don't want to engage with life I feel horrible when I've had a bout of this so yep. 
we just got curious. Now, in Australia at that point, to send off for a stool sample was unheard. Well, yes, you could get it done, but the comprehensive stool samples that we wanted to get, you just, you just couldn't get. So we found an incredible um, understanding doctor who heard us when we said, there's something going on here. This is not autism. There's something more to it. Now, every other doctor that we'd spoken to said, look, you, you've just got to accept He's that autistic. Yeah. his prognosis for the rest of his life is non-verbal, non-functional. It's going to live with you. He's never going to go to school. He's not going to achieve any of your my, milestones that you would expect from your child. Wow. wow. So to find this one beautiful doctor that believed in my, you know, my kind of curiosity, like, let's just dive in here. Let's find. And you would know this with your Yeah, so, very well. Yeah, so we sent off the stool sample and it came back that DNI had Clostridium difficile, which is mm -hmm. actually really life-threatening. Oh, wow. So, you know, luckily he was still surviving. It's a type of bacteria, is it? Or, so yeah. it's a type of bacteria that um, is, it, it is basically um, antibiotics at high uses of antibiotics. What happens is it kills off all of the beneficial strain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but Clostridium difficile can survive in the presence of antibiotics. So it's antibiotic resistant. Mm -hmm. So antibiotics will kill everything else off. And this guy oh, good stuff. And goes, wow, yay. You know, I've got this vacant plot of land. Yep. It for me. And so he was just completely overrun with clostridium. Oh, and wow. I had done a lot of research about clostridium and specifically how it had affected children on the spectrum mm. so there was some great research by some pioneering doctors about the fact that clostridium releases a metabolite which is an endotoxin mm. and unfortunately not only does it compromise the gut and these endotoxins leak through the gut into the bloodstream it also compromises our blood brain barrier which is oh. our protective barrier that stops things getting into your brain hence the encephalitis at 13 yes. that you had yes yes wow. so he had got it had gone through the blood brain barrier and it had attached to certain receptors in his brain that was speech wow. and socialization and learning so he was in fact no autistic or did now have a really horrific undiagnosed infection that was causing significant inflammation. inflammation. Wow. What could we do about this? So, yeah, so we kind of embarked on this, like let's learn everything about clostridium difficile. Let's learn about its effect on the brain and how can we fix that? So clostridium, unfortunately, being antibiotic resistance, there's not much you can do. <laughs> it's a horrific thing. So we were very fortunate to be part of a research study so my daughter, my son and I, and my husband came too, but the three of us, we all went to Calgary in Canada and we were part of a research study where we had fecal microbial transplants. Oh, we, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. FMT. So it's basically you bomb your gut with some really serious antibiotics and get rid of everything, good, bad or ugly. You get rid of everything, including the Clostridium difficile. Wow. And then using someone else's, you know, donor microbiome, basically, microbiome, you replace it back in there. Wow. There's actually flourishing, beautiful microbes in there to take up the space. Because what can happen is you can have C. diff, you can take the antibiotics and you're fine while you're on them. But as soon as you go off them, it just grows back. Mm. There's no opposition, mm. to, um, you know, it growing back. So the FMT provided that opposition and it provided a trajectory moving forward. So my kids are like the youngest kids in the world to have this done. It was like groundbreaking, wow. game changing. We had it from both ends. We had, you know, the tablets to go down and we had it up the other way to, to yep. get the whole digestive system. Yep. And at that point, that was really um, like a game changer, sort of advanced, you know, um, research and and I like it was phenomenal when in Calgary, it's minus 25 degrees, like for an Australian, that's like, whoa, Terrific. You know? <laughs> and, you know, driving around with special tires and it's all really intense. And, you know, we woke up the next day and we needed transplants every day for five days. But we woke up the next day and you know, I talked to Noah every day. I was never assumed that he couldn't hear me. 
Yeah. And I said to him, you know, Noah, how do you feel today? And he said, Mummy, I feel well. Oh, my gosh. And that was the first time they'd spoken to you, basically. Like, oh, my God. You know. Oh, my word. I mean, we'd, we'd heard functional words because, of course, when we found out he had CD, like, we changed his diet. We started fermenting. We, we totally changed our lives. Like, totally changed. Already. Yeah. And so we'd had some functional words. and We'd had a bit of eye contact. We had enough to keep us motivated and to keep us going. Yep. But to, oh. to hear that and just, oh, my gosh. You know, he can speak. He's in, yeah, he's in there. He's in yeah, there. Exactly. He's in there. And then over the course of the days, it's just more contact and more socialization. Immediately. More so words. immediately, yeah. you know, during the transplant time even. Yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, I'm having this done too, right? Yeah. I'm just wow. I just had no idea that, you know, you eat something and then it stays in there and does this digestive Does this job. <laughs> and then like solid stool comes out the other end. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, just, just a game changer for me. And, you know, obviously we when we came back to Australia, we've got to consolidate this beautiful microbiome. Mm-hmm. We've got to work really hard on that. And, you know, I've just, just never known energy because I would have been running on adrenaline my whole life, not wow. energy, adrenaline. Yeah, two, yeah. Different, two different things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, I was like, wow, this is this is how this is a, such an incredible story, Kirsty. Because yeah. I mean, I can just so feel you like to have a child that's not speaking, not making the milestones, not doing the things I meant to. You're told that there's no hope. You know, yeah. I mean, just you know, that resonates with me because of Mum's story, where you know she she was non-communicative, she couldn't speak, and then all of a sudden one day she starts blurts out after I don't know how many hyperbaric treatments. She we were taking her to bed one night, and we were my brother who's very big and he can hold her, and we he said we'll take her off the walker and just see whether she can take some steps, and I'll hold her, and I, and um. So we were doing that and he had to completely hold her up. She's like a rag doll, right? And when we finally get to the bed and she sits down and she goes, she hadn't spoken a word to us before. Oh. She goes, oh, it seems my equilibrium's a little bit off today. <laughs> and we just like, we just were like, oh, oh my God. And then she shut up again and she didn't talk for another. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, but I was like, right, uh, she, she's the intelligent mum is in there. Yeah. She's coming back. We got yeah. this. We're on the right yeah. track. We're doing the right things. In our case, hyperbaric and diet and yeah. tropics. Uh, her brain was coming back. And so, how how many other children are being diagnosed with autism that actually have something gut orientated going on? Maybe not this particular one. Maybe something else. But or how many other people have been told that they have some sort of thing that they don't have yes yeah or that there's another way of approaching it you know god that must have been amazing yeah so so you were lucky enough to have this special transplant is this now done regularly it is and you get this done in new zealand and australia yes yes so you can access it but the thing is now what i have learned so i've gone on to do further study and lots and lots and lots of um you know bedding down of this information this is a while Mm. ago like the land Mm change so much in the gut microbiome and you know we we now know so much that not everyone needs a fmt to recover their gut which is so exciting so for a long time it was like well i think this is the only way forward but Mm. it's not the case anymore so you know a lot of people go oh the only way i can recover is an fmt but um it's really great news that we know so much about the gut we know so much how to modulate the gut Um, Some people need to have an FMT, absolutely, and you can access that. Uh, Children still can't, so my kids are extremely lucky. lucky. Wow. Extremely lucky, and it costs a lot of money. I mean, it still costs us so much to get there. We had to sell our house. We had, like, all our savings, everything just went. Yeah. But, you know, I wouldn't give it up. Yeah, whatever, whatever it takes. I mean, I was, you know, I was got out of tune he's talking he's in school at his age appropriate level and amazing he comes mountain bike riding with me how old is he now 13 oh my gosh yeah, uh, so yeah. He's, all, he's all attitude um but he's you know we now work so much on the cognition so his brain did not develop you know and very differently to your mum 
we know that you know between zero and seven yeah. brain and your gut that is like key wow yeah down basically the rest of your life so wow. from zero to five it just wasn't the normal trajectory of how kids grow and learn and develop so we really had to take Noah right back to the start to mm. calling to all the mm. reflexes we've got a and it's tricky at the moment because he's going through puberty oh my god is he going through puberty oh yeah but <laughs> poor when, you I know but when you go through puberty all the neural pathways come right in and they're all pruned for a teenage boy and so most teenage boys are like Whoa, and you know all over the place as those neural pathways prune so this is a really challenging time for Noah because we were just trying to expand those neural pathways yeah. but because wow. of puberty they've you know they come back in Mm-mm. they're having you know it's it's a big time so it still had ongoing effects even though now he's you know um is he normal growth and you know all the the, the normal so speaking normally oh yeah you can't. all of that yeah <laughs> but you know we have to work on socialization and um you know we really need to work on his immune system so his yep. immune system still gets stuck and still yep. struggles with the inflammation in his brain so wow. and in this course of this time we also found out that Noah and I both have a condition called pandas which is an autoimmune neurological condition associated with an antigen. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, like we both live with quite a serious brain condition. Wow. Um, you know, and so I was diagnosed finally after living a whole life of immune and brain and gut issues. Yeah, I was finally diagnosed in the States. I would have, yeah, wow. been around 38 years old. And when I went in, you, you'll love this story. When I went in, because we were there for Noah, and I said, oh, look, you might as well just run the labs on me because I'm pretty sure, like, I have mm, the same. The same. Mm. And um, so when they ran the labs, they came in and put the paper down and they showed me, and he knows my that I have an area of expertise in this space. So, you know, he was like, oh, well, which test do you think is yours? And so I... I chose the one that didn't have much inflammation and chose the one that I thought was mine because obviously Noah had all those things. And he said, no, 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 <laughs> this is you. Oh, wow. But, like this is all of the inflammatory response and the stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. And then he said, so like, have you been honest with us? Like you must be medicated. You must be on some steroids or anti-inflammatories. You must be on antidepressants. Like you can be honest with us, like you can share. I was like, no, I just use diet, lifestyle. I use, um, you know, all the stuff that you talk about. I use cryotherapy. I use nootropics. I use fermented foods and um, I manage my condition through all natural means. I don't take any. Um, you are too high functioning for that yeah, by the looks of your, your like, tests. Yeah, like <laughs> how can you be an adult that's lived with this condition your whole life and, you know, you've studied a PhD and you've got four degrees and you, like, oh run a business. And well, what is what is PANDAS in, yeah. in, in short? So it's very similar to what I was explaining before, but basically I had strep throat. And just before I had that big inflammatory um, viral encephalitis, I had my tonsils out. Oh. And the antigen from the streptococcus had leaked into my brain. Mm-hmm. So it was, and people don't know that what's infected in your body goes into your brain. No, oh, yes. You know, foggy brain, all that sort of stuff. You have to investigate. You don't just suddenly wake up one day and you've got cognition issues. It's coming from somewhere. And so, yeah, so mine was based around streptococcus infection. And yes, they whipped out my tonsils because they thought that was the best thing, but. Mm. <laughs> No comment. And yeah, the tonsillectomy has made it worse because mm. I have no line of defense you mm. know, to protect me. So, yeah, those antigens, well, sorry, those, yeah, those big sort of endotoxins from the strep, it attaches to the basal ganglia part of yep. your brain, which is movement, speech, wow. socialization. So, yeah, they yep. just couldn't believe it. And I said, but I spend so much time in nature amongst the microbes. And nature will bring your nervous system down. Absolutely. And so 
I had been sort of self-medicating through all of my nature and my sports and you've managed it so well uh, but it, it was such an anomaly to them it was like well wow. truck loads of steroids and this and this and so I was fermented foods <laughs> no, for me. have you tried hyperbaric you know like because we were yeah you have great because yeah because yeah. yeah. that again for that brain yes exactly inflammation would be yeah. very powerful it was interesting about two and a half years ago I had a quite serious accident on the netball court and um, suffered a traumatic brain injury and we were all so worried because of my brain is yeah. you know, it's, it's already in trouble it's yeah. already my Achilles heel but I just went into full you know my mode of everything that yeah. I know that recovers the brain and I, I like I was back after yep. six weeks Yep. Hey, well, well, considering what's happened in your life, you probably might not recover from. It. I'm like, no. yeah, because your brain's had all these hits I already. So obviously, your brain's quite a good one because well, <laughs> very I bright, know. cookie. I, <laughs> very bright. I keep working on it, but it's disorganized. Like I can't follow sequence. Like I can't fill out a form. <laughs> can't follow sequential thought very well. You can do a PhD program. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really doesn't really equate there. Firstly. No, but that's <laughs> big serious thinking, right? Yep. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Wow, that's quite a story. So um, so how can we actually be proactive if we can't get an FMT, you know, yeah. fecal matter tra a transplant or whatever you call it, if, and perhaps we don't have pandas, hopefully not, but there are a lot of people listening who may have to have autistic children because yes. it's like something like one in 40 or something ridiculous yeah. now. Yeah. And you have to ask yourself why. I had Dr. David Minkoff on the show a few months ago and he was saying, you know, it used to be one in 250,000. Yeah. Now it's like something like one in 40. What's going on? You know, we've got to start asking ourselves, yeah. is it our food? Is yeah. it our digestion? Is it our microbes? What the heck is going yeah. on? Is it, dare I say it, vaccines back in the day? Mm -hmm. um, you know, not, not talking about the current one, but just generally um, yeah. with aluminiums and things like that, causing autoimmune um, disorders. What is it? You know, and that's still a, a big question mark. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of stuff happening in that space. I'm not abreast of it all, but um, yeah. So what is your take on how can we, sitting listening to this, how can we look after our microbiome better? What can we learn today mm -hmm. that can help us? And, and then we'll get on to your programs because you've got big whole programs that we can yes. we can go <laughs> and do. And now that we've found you. Yeah. Um, but tell us, what's your take on how do we look after our gut then? Yeah. So the first thing is just test, don't guess. Mm -hmm. So it, I just, it's phenomenal how far the testing has come. You know, even in the last 18 months, it's just ex exploded. We wow. can really find out what is happening in our gut and we can find out what it is doing to the rest of our body. So don't sit around going, oh, I'll try an anti-candida diet this week or I think I'll take some parasite herbs or maybe I'll go to the chemist or the pharmacist or the health food store and I'll try this little mixture because I think I've got an overgrowth of this. Just don't mess around with that. Uh -huh. Go in and spend the money on getting a comprehensive stool analysis because suddenly it's the window into your health. Right. So like if I had been able to find out that Noah had Clostridium difficile, when it first flared up at 13 months, imagine as opposed to almost five. And I see so many people with these things that, you know, they went to Morocco, they mm. caught a bug, they had a horrific, you know, you know, belly of some description and they came back and then it was just this gradual decline. Yeah. Yeah. And suddenly they're 40 and they've got an autoimmune condition and they feel absolutely crapola. And when and they I don't equate the two because it's this insidious slow decline mm. and it's only until you know like I'll get into a consult and say when was the last time that you felt felt well and it's interesting it always like oh well I you know I felt fine and then I was overseas or you know I had this big trauma and then I just got food poisoning or and you can often pinpoint it which is good so just sitting with and you know finding out the history and really diving into that can help but the number one thing is just don't mess around. Just get the test and find out what you're dealing with. And it can make the biggest difference. The Where do we get the test, Kirsty? You know, like, I mean, we can go to you. We can yes. go through your programs and you, that would have a comprehensive the test plus. 
yes. whatever is required, I suppose, at the yes. end of it. Yeah. Um, so I have lots and lots and lots of clients in New Zealand and we we use two tests and one test we can ship from Australia, that's fine. Mm-hmm. And then there's another test that we organise through Nutripath that we work with Nutripath New Zealand. So mm-hmm. we're, you know, quite used to organising and ordering those tests. Oh, wow. Okay, that's on my yeah. family's agenda this yeah. year then. <laughs> <laughs> if I had my way, Medicare approved, oh, every it? year, that yeah. would just be your barometer. You like, know what, Kirsty, one of my, like a bit off topic, but one of my visions is to create an institution and I have no means and resources and way to do this right now, but okay. I, my big vision is to have a, a one-stop shop where you come in once a year for a woman of fitness, you get your microbiome tested, you get your whole genome yeah. sequenced, you get an fMRI or an MRI, you get yeah. echocardiograms and you get, you know, e- e- ECGs and blood tests and and then we get all of this data and then we have people who can help us interpret that data and go okay i think you've got cancer growing in your can in your pancreas or something you yeah. know that's just starting let's get onto it now or you've got a problem in your microbiome with the xyz to start this program you know wouldn't that be great if we had a one-stop shop rather yeah. than us piecing together you know Oh, it's wonderful. I found Kirsty now. I'm going to sort my microbiome out. And then I'm going to go to Lisa and I'll get my epigenetics done. And then I'll go over there and I'll get my XYZ done. And I'll, you know, and and only very, very proactive people are going to do that. And it costs a shitload of money. And but, you know, if you if if this was actually a one-stop shop, and if we could get it to being um democratized so it got to a point where it was demonetized because it was a standard system that every person went through and yeah. it was funded by the the medical system as a preventative so that we catch all these diseases before yeah. they take off and become out of control and then we're putting band-aids on band-aids on festering wounds you know yeah because the approach that we have this jigsaw puzzle you know and I know this type of program is available in the states and but it's you know high-flying executives yeah. who earn millions of dollars that can afford it right now but if this approach was actually in the medical model you know and this is what I'm hoping and I was hoping Mm -hmm. you know I'm I'm thinking of doing a PhD something around these topics you know Mm -hmm. is there a way I don't know if I can manage it (laughs) but we'll see (laughs) um because this this new approach of being ahead of the game ahead of the curve before not behind the curve we're always waiting till the person is diabetic Mm -hmm. before we're making you know doing something and giving them insulin and then the the horse is bolted Mm. you know and then you've already got the the comorbidities that are already in in line with that you've got an increased cancer risk you've got an increased risk of alzheimer's you've got an increased risk of heart disease etc 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 and that's just on the metabolic side of things Mm. you know and if we if we were doing this type of stuff preventatively and at the moment it's up to you and me and you know a thousand other specialists in their areas and you've got to go shopping yes so yeah. one of the other dreams i've had is to make a like a dating app for um for medical right oh, i love that i love that <laughs> i have no idea how to develop an app or anything like that but um that's well you know like like you would have your uber or your you know airbnb or your whatever you know all these platforms like we've got the technology now yeah. If we've got some clever brains who know how to do all that fancy software stuff, which I have no idea of, um, but you know what I mean? Wouldn't yeah. that be amazing? Yes. Like a dating app for, for medicals. You could find out who's the best longevity specialist and what's their ratings and how do I get to see them? And, you know, whatever, <laughs> or chiropractors or, you know. Oh, I love be- it. I love it. And that is really the reason why I started up Cultured Wellness was because I didn't want someone to have to go somewhere else to get the testing and someone to have to go and get the bloods and yeah. go and have to get the genetic stuff done. Like um, so you do it all within mm. in-house. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's so- why we need to like, we need to get together. Sorry. I'm jumping in, but I'm like <gasps> collaborations mm. between people like you and me and, you know, exactly a number of others that we can at least go, Hey, I've got a patient here though. I've, I've hit, hit the wall or I've done everything I can do. Hmm. can I pass them over to you so that you can do the, your piece of the puzzle you know yeah, yeah. and it is you know I'm slowly you know getting the kind of you know feelers out for the networks because you know we're big fans obviously on IV vitamin C yeah 
certain IVs and, mm. and finding, um, you know, medical clinics and places in Australia. And we've also been looking, you know, over in New Zealand as well, where we can send our patients to, to and have a beautiful collaborative approach with those medical centres to, you know, ring and oh. say, hey, we've got a culture wellness person coming in. And we, we use a shared care approach. So the doctor can then go and have a look at their notes, can see what they're on, what they've been doing, and then get them in for the IV or get them in for the hyperbaric chamber or get oh, them some, yeah, you know, this is perfect. Or, or some, you know, saunas or just, just accessing some stuff because, you know, not everyone's going to have a sauna in their house or not everyone's going to have a cry machine or a hyperbaric chamber. And they're very, very important. But like you said, it all costs a truckload of money. And, yep. you know, we have no money. We sold everything just to kind yep. of get this all back on track. And so yeah, you and I both, we've both spent, you know, a second house on um, yes. getting our family's health back to square yeah. one, you know, not even square one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then going, hang on a minute, you know, how else can we help? So we have to talk offline on all that <laughs> stuff because we have to collaborate on our networks, but, you know, yeah. and start developing yeah. these, these mastermind groups, really, yeah. or, or a group of people that are, have this attitude of it's not, no, these are my little marbles. I'm not sharing with them with you, you know, because that's not an approach that's going to actually help no. get the client it doesn't get yeah. anyone anywhere yeah. yeah yeah and it's like yeah. hang on you you're better at this you, yeah. you take over here you know yeah. but probably the other thing that I would say is you know once you've done your testing which is so important is um and you know you would be a big believer in this like if you want to make change you've got to front up to make the change and what I see is really difficult for people is they want to make change to their diet they understand how important their gut health is but if they don't include fermented foods and they don't include nourishing foods for the gut, they're relying on willpower. Mm -hmm. And no one can get anywhere with willpower. Oh, that's you might hard. last a day, you might last three, but you will get stressed. And when you get stressed, your cortisol levels go up. And when your cortisol levels go up, your insulin levels go up, and then you require carbs and sugar. And no amount of willpower can go against that primal built-in set point that we have that if we're in a state of fight or flight, we need carbs. Yep. Quick fuel because it thinks it's needing to run away. Yep. And so So we're sabotaged by our microbiome, basically. Yeah. Like it, You've got to our, go our bugs are telling our brain what chemistry and that chemistry is making us do things we don't want to do and this yeah. is what addiction is and this is what yeah. cravings are mm. and, and understanding that it's not all your fault people <laughs> no so if you, you know you, you include fermented foods and they start to change the landscape and then suddenly you're relying on your microbes and you're relying on your body system as opposed to willpower and then you know oh it's been like two weeks and I haven't felt like having a donut or I haven't felt like having a glass of wine or you know, and you start to see these incremental changes because your your body is working how it should as opposed to working in this real state of alarm and stress. So, you wow. know, focusing on, yes, your food is very important. You just got to cut out the crap. It's as simple as that. And everyone knows that. It's what everyone finds hard and doesn't know is that you should never rely on willpower. Diets will never work. It's it's your army. It's those it's your army, army and you go, and you they have to be working for you, and that's where you start to fly. Because like I just don't crave any of those foods. Like I crave boring stuff like bone broth and <laughs> out, and you know like you <laughs> and your body. Because my microbes tell me like you know I've just been out for a massive two hour ride, and my body and my microbes is telling me like you need some protein and you need yeah, yeah. electrolytes and you need you know, and I can actually hear my body telling me what it needs to rebuild after, wow. like, you know, being out on the bike. Very different to if I would have been on the bike previously, I would have been like, oh, I need a bag of chips. Oh, I really feel like some shortbreads. And that's what you would then go and eat, you know. Mm. And who recovers from a bag of chips and shortbreads? Like, yeah. Nobody's body is going to 
but our old way of thinking and my certainly my old way was thinking oh i've just smashed the crap out of myself for x amount of hours i can afford to have the chips yeah. i can afford to have the that used to you know and it was reason why I, you know because i love my food um you know i'd, I'd go and run long so i could eat more yes <laughs> my brother my brother does that this much food equates to this much exercise yeah. and it does work it does unfortunately not with my body type at least (laughs) it does not work but what about like um one of the programs i do you know some people are very sensitive to the histamines and things um and then some uh and you'll know more than this about this than i do but the uh uh, fermented foods can sometimes cause reactions in some people's bodies can you talk to that a little bit yeah So we have two types of fermented foods. So one is a wild type and you're basically fermenting what's in the cabbage, what's in the food, what's in the sauerkraut and what's in your environment. So whatever microbes are around you. So they have histamine forming foods, so lactate forming um, metabolites. Mm -hmm. And for some people, um, I mean, most people who are sensitive to histamines have either got parasites or they've got things like biophilia wadsworthia in their gut. So they need to investigate as opposed to saying, oh, I'm histamine intolerant, I can't have it. Ah. We also have microbes in our gut that consume histamine and actually help us to not have histamine issues. And so when you do a test, you can see, oh, I don't have any histamine consuming microbes. No wonder I'm having all of these issues. And I've got parasites and parasites release histamines as their byproduct. So we need to investigate with histamine stuff. But you also can have um, cultured ferments. Now, these are very specific ferments where the strains have been specifically chosen and they uh, the lid goes on and it's in a very controlled environment and you only ferment the strains that you know as opposed to a wild, it could be anything. And so with someone who is struggling with histamines or they're struggling with lactate forming metabolites, then you need to choose D-lactate bacteria strains. Oh, and so, D-lactate. Yeah, yep. because a lot of us don't have the enzyme that converts the lactate into the D-lactate. And so uh-huh. we we'll have a lactic acid buildup and then we get arthritis and you know joints pain and all of that kind of stuff. Wow. Whereas the D-lactate strains are broken down, they down-regulate histamines, they help to consume it, and they don't cause a lot of the reactions. So that that is the sole reason why I developed my cultures was because oh, when okay. I came, you know, when I first started getting into fermented foods, I couldn't hand any of the wild ferments. They made matters mm. worse. My body couldn't process it. I was just full of lactate felt horrible and then I kind of dived into the research and was like oh there's these two different types and yeah I didn't know that yeah yeah so the D-lactate strains is the ones that are in the the cultures I developed and you know exactly what you're fermenting and you know that they're going to be beneficial for you and you can start with those at you know small amounts start to build up your microbiome and like so I can have wild ferments now fine you know and I have the genetics that I can't break down histamines and, you know, salicylates and all those sorts of things, but my gut's doing it for me. So right. I don't worry about it. Um, and then as you sort of grow up from your cultured foods, you still stick on your cultured foods, but you can dabble in the wild ferments. So, well, you know. Build up your very, tolerance to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, like you've done with yourself. Yeah. So a very big mission of mine is I can't stand when people say, oh, well, I can't have fermented food. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought, you know, like certain people are not suited to having the fermented foods, you know. Um, Their gut is producing so much, you know, it's called an auto brewery effect. Your gut will produce toxins and all sorts of stuff. And some of those toxins are histamine forming. So you've got to get rid of that problem but also the strains as well. So when you say you've got these cultures, so we can buy these cultures off you, do we have to make our own yogurt or something from those cultures or can we just take them in a tablet form? No, so you make them yourself. So we have the starter culture, which is like a cup of the yogurt. Yeah. And then you make your own coconut yogurt from that. So you ferment it out yourself at home 
And then you can start low and slow and you can slowly work your way up to being able to have a robust amount of fermented foods in your diet. Wow. So you seemed over the yogurt. So like we did the yeah. program, you'd yeah. send me over a cup of yogurt. Yeah. And then what would I have to do with it? Yeah. And then oh, you basically just need a jar and you need some coconut cream and you put the cream, coconut cream, and you put the um, starter together whack it in the jar and then in about you know 24 to 48 hours it's ready and then it it just tastes really tart it tastes like a yogurt super tart super tangy and then you eat that but the cultures that I developed have nine different strains in them and the strains are researched for their efficacy for autoimmune conditions for neurological con- you know disorders wow. for um, digestive capabilities um, being able to create nutrients like b12 for immune response so yeah i kind of like went around and it's like hand picking the perfect netball team really yeah <laughs> yeah, went, yeah yeah i hand picked my, my and pick. you buy so how do you buy it like how do you have this regularly like because you need to do this constantly don't you you need to be having these yeah uh, it's not yeah. like a one and done you have a no, cup no, no. of yogurt and you're right so you make your first two liters and you make it in a two liter batch and once that's been fermented, you take a cup from that to start your next batch. Ah. Take a cup to start your next batch. After five uh, ferments, you, it's best to get a new culture because we can't really um, look at the efficacy of keeping those beautiful cultured strains. Slowly yep. you're starting to introduce wild strains and people can sometimes become sensitive again after those five um, batches. So then right. we go back to a new culture starter and start over again. Right. So you you basically, and how long so would a starter kit last you for? And then, you know, and uh, before you have to, to get the next lot sort of thing, like a month at a time. Well, or Yeah. I mean, once you've made a batch, it will last in the fridge for three to six months because it's a wild, you know, food. Yeah. Um, it's a fermented food. And then, so it depends how much you eat. So yeah. I sort of recommend a cup of yogurt a day. So that's yeah. 50 mils so you know what's that sort of eight cups in the two liters and so oh, so do it a fair amount yeah so you need to get you know go through it and then you just make your next batch and wow um, this, is, this is great so and we can get that because you know like people go and buy the whatever off the shelf probiotic uh, and think yeah. that it um is going to be doing stuff and it's not even getting to the places it needs to from what i understand no and then also, you know, the probiotics, probiotics on the market at the moment, like one capsule might have 3 million CFU. So colony forming units, which is basically how we measure the strength of the probiotic. Whereas like a cup of, you know, the culture wellness yogurt that you've fermented yourself at home has 41 billion. Holy heck. So people have to go really slow. It's a therapeutic food. Like if yep. you've got gut dysbiosis, um, and you, you know, you've got to start at a quarter of a teaspoon at a time. It, wow. Yeah. And then and you work, work your way up to a cup. Yeah. And then you have a cup a day and have some coconut kipper and have some sauerkraut and have some beet kvass. And, and it just becomes every time you have a main meal, you know, you just have a little handful of something on the side to help with digestion, help with your stomach acid to be able to support you to, you know, extrapolate those nutrients. A lot of people too are not having, you know, um, and, and it's just genetics. So looking at, when I, you know, I studied the, the genetics and things, and a lot of people don't produce a lot of amylase, a lot of lipase, a lot of these pancreatic, and, and then when they get older, of course, you're not producing these um, enzymes that break down our food. Uh, can it help with that as well? Yeah, Absolutely. So in the absence of those digestive enzymes or in the absence of stomach acid, which is another major problem that we have in today's, you know, huge issues, it, you know, it fermented foods is pre-digested because of the fermenting process. So you don't require such a robust amount of digestive enzymes and it actually supports the excretion of stomach acid and sort of bringing that stomach acid up and creating that acidic environment to digest. So it's kind of like your little helping hand if your digestive system is, um, you know, weak or it's just not your enzymes are fire that, you know, it, every time you digest a meal, it requires 500 mils of blood to wow. go to the digestive system 
to even get on with the job, let alone wow. the amount of stomach acid you need to make. And, you know, it starts in our brain. We have a, you know, the cephalic phase in our brain, which actually gets the, the stuff, all of the digestive enzymes in our the amylose. Stuff. Yep. So, you know, this is sort of whole process of this one fails. And if this one fails, at least you've got your fermented foods helping yeah. you a little bit. And why, you know, like um, a lot of people have been put on protein pump inhibitors when they get heartburn and reflux. And, you know, it, it's actually the gut not having enough stomach acid, mm -hmm. not too much. And when we put in a proton pump inhibitor, which, okay, if you've got a stomach ulcer, you may need mm -hmm. for a short period of time because it stops you being able to digest your proteins and break the foods down. And so it becomes then this vicious circle of then people become protein deficient and, you know, then their body's not getting enough proteins to do what it needs to do because you're on these proton pump inhibitors. Instead of going the other way and putting in um, more stomach acid into the stomach to make it the, the esophagus close off essentially and stop yeah. the, the reflux coming up and down. But this would also help, wouldn't it? I mean, apart from the whole, the stomach acid and taking betaine, as a tablet, which you can do, but this yep. would be a, another way of approaching the same problem. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. This is just insane. Look, we, we've gone all over the show. So <laughs> Kirsty, um, <laughs> I'm really excited for this. We're going to put all the links in the show notes to your um, packages and your coaching and, and what you do um, mm -hmm. at Cultured Wellness. Um, what, any, any last words that you'd like to, to share and get people to thinking about before they go away and, you know. Yeah, I think, I think just, you know, I suppose my kind of big, you know, mantra is just be super curious about what's going on and, and try your best to become connected with your body to be curious. So, you know, a massive revelation for me was I was living so disconnected from my actual body and its functions and what was happening I was so elevated and stressed out and when you're unwell you are in a state of fight or flight mm -hmm. all the time yep and so I just really encourage people to be able to become more in tune with their body and listen to what their body is saying and and settle with it and and really investigate that and be curious as opposed to like oh <laughs> you know this is how it's always been and this is how it will be and because my family has a history of that yeah so I'm that, destined for I'm, this I'm destined to it and it's, it's just not where 90 well you know between 80 and 90 percent microbial community so microbes mm -hmm. fungi and you know viruses and then only about 10 to 20 percent DNA yeah <laughs> so it's, the DNA is not what we should be focusing on yes we need to know but it's actually the microbes and those fungi and viruses that make up our whole body that actually interact through that, you know, obviously you understand epigenetics. And, yeah. You know, that's the interaction. And so we can switch those genes on and off through our microbes and through how they're performing and what they're doing. And so we, we, we've got to know that piece of the puzzle and most people don't. So, yeah, that curiosity and it's just... in and, and taking that responsibility and owning it and wanting more for yourself is is really important and such a game. And not just giving up when some somebody says to you, you know, your son's got autism and there is no way forward, or you your mum's yeah, nonverbal, not going to meet any of the milestones. It's yeah. not always the case, is that they don't understand. And this is where being an investigator, you have to investigate. There's yeah. no one person, not you, not I, not anybody who's got yeah. all the answers and knows everything. But if you just keep chipping away at, okay, well, I'll try this and I'll develop that and I'll learn this. And, mm. and you, you have a much better chance at least mm. of, of getting out, you know, healthy from whatever you're, you're dealing with yeah. rather than just going, okay, that's it. I have to give up. That's my, and, and it's the same with the DNA stuff that it's not deterministic. Hmm. It is just giving you a heads up mm -hmm. and here's what you may be dealing with. So if you put the right environment yeah. around that DNA, so if you've got your DNA in the center and then you have the right lifestyle yeah. and yeah. food and nutrition and sleep around that to support your genetics, then you've got a good combination going on, which is easier said than done. But yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> at least if you know what you're dealing with, you can start to, to operate and go in the right direction. Yeah. 
yeah and that and that's the thing you, you know that you know genetically you're prone to inflammation mm. Listen, I just need to focus more than my friend here who is not prone to it on an anti-inflammatory diet and lifestyle yep it just yep. sets you up beautifully I yeah think it's the best piece of information um and if you don't know it you're how are you going to know? How does yeah, it yeah. And people don't, well, they, oh, I don't want to know. I'd rather not know. But yes, because then you can fix it. Yeah, yeah. You know, otherwise you're going to get hit poof, with that, whatever, stroke, heart attack, name, yeah. name, pick your poison. It's got to come and hit you fair in the face. Yeah. So why stick your ha- head in the scene? Why not look it in the face earlier? Be courageous. Look it in the face and go, okay, this is the genes I've been dealt. What do I do about it? What's yeah. the best I can do? Yeah. And then make your decisions from there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You've been wonderful today, Kirsty. If um, yeah. it, 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 your your face glows, <laughs> you glow health. So some of you're doing something right, man. I was choking off air. It's because of, of the amount of just <laughs> the amount of sweating from sport. <laughs> you are just glowing with health. That's what you are. That's all those microbes going. Microbes going. Yes, I've got everything <laughs> I need. <laughs> so we all want to look like Kirsty. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today, Kirsty. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Cool. I've stopped.